Hello? Hello? Hello, Professor. Unmute yourself, Professor. Uh, Professor, Professor Swales, please. Enable enable your microphone. Like that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Hello. I can, I can hear you and you can hear me. Yeah, loud, loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hello? Hello. Hello. Hello, Saliha. This is the moderator. Yes, we can start, Mr. Aish, please. We can start. You'd like me to start? We definitely Normally, yes. Good evening for some. We are right. so pleased to host you in this second edition of the international webinar. Please, the floor is yours. Let's start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray. This is kind of you. This is so kind of you. So I cannot actually find the right word to express my gratitude to Democratic Arabic Center for having accepted to host this event and who actually hosted many events I organized and is going to uh, host another event in, in, in the near future, inshallah. Uh, so everyone is attending with us, all the attendees, friends, and those who are watching us uh, live via Facebook, uh, you're most welcome and I'm very thrilled to see some friends here. Uh, today is so special because one of, uh, of the leading figures is present with us, Professor John Swells, and it was always a dream for me to meet this, um, this outstanding scholar. And thank you, Professor, because you made my dream come true. Uh, my gratitude goes all, also to my two invitees, other invitees, uh, Dr. Ravia Bugibs, who never declined my invitations, um, though she was very hectic in the weekend and very tired, but she, she could never actually uh, say no to my invitation. Pipit Rahayu from Indonesia, and now it's 1.30. 
a.m. in the morning, but she prefers to be with us and stayed awake. Thank you so much to all my invitees, to all the speakers. Without forgetting, of course, my co-chair, Professor Nisreen Rouar, who honored me to be um, to be uh, to to be assisting me today, and uh, Suhila, Professor Suhila Halalit and uh, Dr. Saliha uh, Bilalmi are no exception. And I'm very, very thrilled because you are surrounding me. You are by my side every time I ask for your kind assistance. So everyone is welcome. Did I forget to thank someone else? <laughs> <laughs> well, without yes, further me. you did. <laughs> Three. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so um, I apologize if I've forgotten someone. And you know that I, I, I never prepare script speech. I use just, uh, I improvise a speech on the spot because I uh, I prefer to be spontaneous. So uh, I send my apologize if I've forgotten someone. Um, well, without uh, further ado, so I hand over the floor to my co chair, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Nsiruwar, uh, to say a word. So yeah. over to yeah, over to you. Thank you, for, uh, Dr. Fuzia. I'm really honored also to be a uh, part of this webinar. So first of all, I, I, uh, I want to say good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for being here with us today to discuss an important issue, an important topic in ESP, which is about issues in ESP classes, local and international perspectives. So the local ones, uh, or the local perspectives will be discussed by Dr. Radia Bugips from ONS Constantine, uh, uh, Algeria. And the international one will be uh, considered uh, or discussed by uh, Professor John Swayze and uh, Dr. Pipet Rahu from Indonesia. So uh, first of all, I have to introduce myself. I'm uh, Professor Rawar Nisreen. I'm from uh, Beji Mukhtar University, Alaba. Uh, it is my first uh, time to discuss or to be part of ESP uh, webinar uh, because uh, principally I'm a teacher of didactics and I like the didactics, but I am really curious to know or to, uh, to have more ideas or to, be, to have more knowledge about uh, the issues of whether they are the same, they are similar, they are different, and how different they are and what are the probable or the kind of uh, uh, solutions that can be uh, that can be proposed for both uh, either the uh, on the national or international local and international uh, level uh, i made uh, a bit uh, uh, short uh, 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 investigation here about asp issues what are the main issues in esp and i found that there are five main bro uh, broad problems we have teaching pedagogy, the teacher himself, the design of the course, students' ability, and students' needs. So we are all uh, ears in order to listen to our uh, specialists, the local and international ones, in order to get more information and knowledge about this topic. Thank you uh, for all of you in advance. Thank you, Thank you Nisreen. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So now we hand over the floor to our moderator, Dr. Saleh Ablani. Yeah. So over to you, Saleh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rouha uh, Nisreen. Thank you, uh, Fuzia. Well, good evening or good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to our second international webinar today on issues in ESP class, local and international perspectives, chaired by Dr. Fuzia uh, Rouha and Nisreen Rouar. We are thankful to the Democratic Arabic Center and the University of Benghazi in Libya for hosting this webinar. Well, my name is Salih Abdelani. It's a pleasure to moderate this webinar and it's great to see so many of you here. Really warm welcome to all guests and attendees. We have great panel with us today. So if you have any questions during the webinar, that you would like us to answer, please make sure to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to be able to answer them. Well, we will try to get through as many of them as possible and hopefully it will be a very helpful experience for you. Let us say hi to panelists. We will start with Dr. Radia Bugabs, 
thanks for joining us, Radia. The title of her in the, uh, intervention is ESP Teaching in the Digital Era, Raising ESP Practitioners' Awareness Towards Their New Roles. But let us first start by introducing you. Dr. Radia Bugabs is an associate professor at the ENS of Constantine, Algeria. She holds a PhD degree in Applied Linguistics from the University of Constantine I. She has been teaching English for more than 15 years. Her research interests focus on initial English <coughs> language teacher education, drawing on teaching English for uh, general purposes, teaching English for specific purposes, theory, teacher profile, classroom activities, etc. Radia has undertaken research on teacher education, innovative teaching approaches, developing language skills, language learning policies, and the use of ICTs in foreign language learning and teaching. Integrating multi-modal uh, pedagogy in EFL classrooms. Her works have been published in national and international journals, including Modern Journal of Language Teaching Methods, International Arab Journal of English for Specific Purposes, Journal of Studies in Language, Revue de Traduction et Langue, Revue des Sciences Humaines, Culture and Society, among others. Radia participated in many national and international conferences, allowing her to meet and exchange her investigations and teaching experience with colleagues from Algeria and foreign countries. She is an associate editor in different journals, including the Ultralang Journal, GSLCS Journal, Forum uh, des Enseignants Journal. Welcome to Issues on ESP webinar. You, are, you can start now. Thank you, thank you, my thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so pleased to meet uh, my dear colleagues uh, again, and uh, we never stop uh, our talks uh, on uh, the importance of this uh, issue. Well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Fuzia Rua, for giving us this opportunity to share our uh, thoughts, our uh, uh, modest experiences in uh, this field with uh, our uh, colleagues. I wish my contribution today would uh, be uh, fruitful. So uh, let me uh, begin while well, I share my screen. Okay. Tell me yeah, when things are okay, Saliha. You're allowed now. You're allowed to share your screen, Nadia. The yes, we are, we are still waiting, okay? And now so you share the screen. Well, not yet. Try again. Try again, Nadia. Logically, I'm sharing it. Well, I will try again. Okay. Okay. Yes. No, it's okay. And now? Yeah. It's processing. It's coming. Uh, it's okay, Adia. Okay. Mala. I need the full screen. Now yeah. it's okay. Get yeah, it's the full screen now. Okay. So the title of my presentation now. Uh, uh, is it ESP teaching in the digital era? Raising the ESP practitioners one as well as their new roles. As we know that uh, uh, teaching in the digital era is uh, now uh, a new perspective that is uh, really uh, grabbing uh, researchers' attention. So educational technology progress provides, as we know, enormous tools for enhancing the teaching and learning process ICT instruments such as the computer and the internet that brought new modes of learning, including model platforms, Google Classroom, Zoom, etc., reshaped the ESP teaching learning environment. So, uh, my uh, perspective in today's presentation is digging deeper in this area to try to find answers to the following questions. To what extent ESP teaching is affected by all these innovations? 
And what are the skills ESP practitioners should be aware about to fit a generation of learners that is more digitally oriented? So let's identify the major problem. ICT use in higher education proved efficient in enhancing teaching and learning, hence inducing educational reforms that positively affect a generation of learners who are digitally oriented there. Mm -hmm. Problem, something happened. Well, uh, I will try to share it again. Sorry for this technical problem. Is it okay, Saliha? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we are, we are seeing the screen now. Okay. Since ICT application for teaching learning purposes has become an issue of debate in contemporary education, what other skills ESP practitioners should be aware of, knowing that uh, they should uh, fulfill four major roles adding to their role as a teacher? So to fulfill their roles adequately while manipulating the ICT tools in their ESP classroom. So my focus is on a new skill that we want to uh, really uh, uh, enhance in an ESP teacher uh, practitioner's profile. The current study advocates the need to reconsider the ESP teacher profile and necessary education. Hence, the main objective are as follows. We want to investigate teachers' attitude towards the facilities ICT tools use could bring to the ESP classroom. We want also to explore teachers' awareness of the utility of digital literacy skills in the profile of an ESP practitioner. And we want also to certify whether keeping up-to-date digital literacy skills via teacher education, future programs is perceived as a prerequisite. ICT or digital literacy, what does it mean? It represents this minimal set of skills that facilitates for the user in the going effective operations with software tools or in performing basic information retrieval tasks, according to Buckingham 2006. ESP, let's dig deeper in the literature or trying to know what the literature is saying about ICT and ESP teaching today. Technology has been utilized in ESP instructions since the introduction of the computer into the classroom throughout the development of the internet and the World Wide Web and to the very invention of mobile and cloud computing technologies. So this necessitates the development of new skills. Teaching ESP in the digital age involves a focus on digital mediation as one component of goal-directed activity and specialized communication practices. Teachers then should be familiar with the technology tools. What attitudes do they hold towards ICT integration? So despite the benefits technology can offer to languages, languages for specific purposes, ESP teachers have demonstrated slow adoption in using new technologies. Why holding uh, or developing such an attitude? This can be due to the lack of awareness and deficient computer literacy and ICT pedagogy, according to a study undergone by Lee in 2018. All this can be due to a mismatch between teachers' previous education and the 21st century educational technologies advances needed the skills. Well, why digital literacy? So to uh, investigate about this uh, important uh, issue, uh, I departed from the following research questions. Uh, the first research question I'm trying to uh, answer is, are teachers aware about the different duties attributed to an ESP practitioner which is one major element in this investigation. Another question we want to dig deep in it is to what extent ESP teaching is affected by progress in ICTs 
The third question, what is ESP practitioners' attitude towards the importance of digital literacy knowledge in teacher education? And the fourth one, how important is the inclusion of the digital literacy training in ESP teacher education? To answer this, these research questions, we adopted a descriptive analytic research design based on a quantitative data analysis procedure, where an online questionnaire was posted to 31 ESP teachers from different universities in Algeria. They responded via the same link, and quantitative data also was saved in the same link. What do the results reveal? Well, first, as far as uh, some background information about uh, the participants, uh, as we notice from this table, uh, they, uh, the majority of them hold a doctoral degree. Uh, they are affiliated to different universities, uh, and uh, the major uh, uh, participants belong to uh, the NS of Constantin and uh, University Brother Maturi. Their field of specialty vary between uh, applied linguistics, uh, language and didactics, civilizations and literature, and others. As for the teaching experience, the majority of the informants are experienced teachers. They have their, or they have practiced teaching for more than 12 years. Let's move to their ESP teaching experience when asking them about their experience in teaching ESP, as you can see from this figure, 64% more or have already experienced yet, three, 35 haven't. The ESP teaching, what they have experienced, uh, they have taught English in engineering, mechanical for mechanical engineer setting, and medical sciences, biologists, business English, economics, ESP courses for administrative, administrative staff, ESP for science and technology, political sciences, and et cetera. So uh, they represent, uh, or the sample uh, is uh, really a representative uh, sample uh, that could help us uh, answer the uh, research questions. As for their knowledge about the SPA practitioners, different uh, duties, uh, when asking them about uh, the different roles fulfilled by uh, the SP practitioners, uh, all of them, uh, are aware about uh, the four roles attributed to an ESP teacher, adding to his role as a teacher. So they all agree that uh, an ESP practitioner should uh, is a teacher, uh, material uh, selector, develop new materials. He's an evaluator, he's a collaborator, and uh, he needs to keep himself updated with uh, the ESP research, meaning that uh, he's also a researcher. Let's move to another question, which represents the body of this investigation. When asking them about the different hardware, software, technology tools, they rely on while preparing their courses. As we can see that they rely on some ICT tools ranging from personal computers, presentation tools, including PPTs, Prezi, social media tablets, uh, some uh, translator machines, uh, internet browsers, uh, available YouTube videos, uh, eBooks, etc. As when delivering their courses, we notice that uh, they also rely on a set number of hardware, software, ICT uh, tools. We notice that uh, while, the, 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 while preparing or delivering their courses, they mostly rely on the same digital uh, tools, hardware and software technology tools. Let's move to another question that uh, will back the previous data. When asking them about the necessity to integrate ICT tools in ESP setting, because it would help an ESP practitioner fulfill his roles, they all of them agree. They back their answers by the year following uh, testimonies. One of them, one of the respondents says that when they are diversifying the digital teaching tools, this would facilitate the ch challenging tasks because ICT tools save time and energy. Also, another one adds saying that educational technology would help the teacher widen the choices available for material selection. 
uh, within the same scope, another one it goes further saying that the use of technology is highly recommended in today's classrooms because it elicits students' motivation, imagination, collaboration, and confidence. Another question that seeks to uh, check the importance of digital literacy in an ESP teacher uh, profile, as we can see that uh, all of them uh, agree between the range but strongly agree or agree about the importance of uh, digital literacy in the 20th century uh, as a 20th century concept uh, because they agree that developing this skill would facilitate for the ESP teacher manipulating the ICT tools as it is a recommendation in today's uh, ESP and not just ESP, but whatever teaching we are involved in. As for the attitude towards the inclusion of digital literacy skill in teacher education, we notice that they hold a positive attitude, ranging from strongly agree to agree. So they agreed there on the importance of including digital literacy training programs in teacher education. So it is among the what is what is recommended there. Uh, we end our investigation by asking uh, the informants to, uh, to uh, further recommend, and we end with this uh, uh, set number of recommendations. As for the different DSP practitioner duties, it is highly recommended to have a clear conceptualization that an ESP practitioner is not only a teacher, but a collaborator, a course designer, a material provider, and evaluator as well. Another recommendation is the necessity to integrate ICTs as it represents a vital, vital to uh, involve ICT tools in any teaching learning process for the demanding world progress. Acquiring new skills, adding to the other skills an ESP practitioner should really be competent in, uh, as we have uh, uh, we have listed there so far, the four other roles. The digital skills is a necessity to cope with the 21st century changing world. The training, the importance of digital literacy training programs in teacher education for the sake of satisfying their ESP learners' learning needs in a digital environment is more than a, a prerequisite or it is a really a master. Updating their digital literacy skills so ESP practitioner needs to keep their uh, this skill in a continuous uh, progress uh, by attending uh, some uh, professional network programs that address the development of the digital uh, literacy uh, skills of uh, ESP uh, practitioner. To uh, conclude, we can say that uh, the global emergence of educational technology brought new modification to the teaching learning environment where the profile of the teacher was mostly affected. To minimize the gap between the SP teacher and the generation of learners who are in fact digitally oriented, adding to some specialized training in the subject matter he gets involved in, the SP teacher has to develop the digital literacy skills to benefit from ICT educational tools. So that's all concerning my presentation. These are uh, some references I've relied on to prepare my uh, modest uh, contribution. Thanks a lot for your being so attentive. Thank you, uh, Radia, for this fruitful uh, and uh, well-presented paper research. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we move to the debate after finishing all uh, the panelists, okay, presentation. Now we move to uh, Professor John Swales. Professor, thank you for joining us. Well, his paper is entitled Course Design for English for specific uh, uh, academic, sorry, purposes, writing materials. Well, Professor John Swales has taught EAP, ESP in Libya, Sudan, UK, and USA. 
Although his main academic work has been in genre analysis and taxo, uh, textography, sorry, he has also been active in the textbook field, having authorized, uh, authored, sorry, or co-authored some ten textbooks over four decades. Although retired, he remains active as a reviewer, scholar, and occasional guest lecturer. Welcome to issues of ESP webinar. You can start, Professor. The floor is yours. Uh, well, Doctor, you have to, uh, um, okay. You have to um, enable your mic, Professor. Uh, enable, yeah. All right. Professor, yeah, it's okay. Okay, and uh, Fauzia, how am I doing with the with the handouts with the sheets? Yes, I can. I can share them. Yeah, you can share them. All right. Yeah. Well, they, they may come about a bit small. All right. Okay. The, the, well, here I am. I'm I'm in my basement, as you can see, uh, uh, and my uh, talk for today focuses on a a small part of genre, but common in STEM fields, in science, technology, medicine, engineering, and also social sciences. The description and discussion of nonverbal material as most commonly contained in tables or graphs, but maybe also be maps and chemical formulae and things like that. This is a, a circumscribed topic in EAP, ESP syllabi, but it has its parallels with other part genres. Consider, for example, the difficult task of the literature review. First efforts may simply consist of paraphrases of what previous researchers have done one by one, piling them up. As a colleague in, in education said to me the other day, I know those things. They are an inert mass of dead material. A more sophisticated, a second shot at this would be essentially a data commentary, picking up generalizations from the literature, finding highlights, and finding exceptions and surprises. And finally, there is the critical commentary of analysis that offers a substantive state of the art analysis of the previous work on the chosen topic. And that's similar to the arguments that I'm going to be presenting for when we're talking about tables and graphs. So although my focus is narrow, it is also historically deep as I review the evolution of EAP materials designed to help non-native speakers show that they can make sense of non-verbal material. Starting with information transfer, and then data commentary, and then critical commentary. So if we could have sheet one. How's here? Can people see that? Ah, okay. Yes. Do I have to do that or does somebody else do that? Yeah, okay. it's okay. We see. Yeah, we can see it. You can see it? Yeah. Okay. All of it or just the top half of the page? Yeah, the top of the page only. Okay, so I have to go up and down. All right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's sheet two. Can we go back to sheet one? Yep, there we are. So, so let me start this story at the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Libya in 1966. I had arrived there as a junior lecturer, um, having done a 
advanced diploma in linguistics and uh, English language teaching at the University of Leeds. And the acting dean said, well, you better become head of the English section uh, because you're the only one with recent graduate training. So there I was, 26 or something, in charge of four or five people. Um, and uh, we had a language laboratory, a technician, and we have five years with the first year and uh, three years with the second year with the engineering students. Um, and we did speaking and listening in the language laboratory, making all our own materials. And when it came to uh, thinking about how we could best help uh, the, the students, uh, I argued in particular that although needs analysis might show that reading their textbooks was the highest priority, if you ask yourselves where the ESP practitioner is most needed, you can see that is that is in writing, that they need help with writing, and you could argue that the reading they would have to learn to do for themselves. So we developed uh, materials for three years. And uh, then uh, Muammar al-Gaddafi came along and there was the Libyan revolution and the, uh, the university was closed for three months. There was a curfew at seven o'clock at night and alcohol was banned. And I remembered then that a nice English gentleman from a London publishing company had come by the year before and looked at the materials I developed and said, oh, those look quite interesting. Uh, we might be able to publish those. So looking at the situation with the university closed, I decided that uh, it was now or never. So I spent the next months while the university was closed trying to shape the materials into a book, into a textbook. And, um, and I did that, and that actually got me a lectureship in a teacher training college in, in the north of England, which was really a waste of time for me, but I got the book published, and uh, that's, uh, that's what it was, writing scientific English. Um, the, First thing I'd like to mention about it is the unit here we go. The unit oh it's frozen. Well the uh there we go, there we are. Uh, doesn't move. All right, well you can see from the top of that. Um, uh, the, the unit three dealt with comparisons. And like, oh, thank you. Like uh, all, most of the early textbooks that was published in the 1970s, there were lots of uh, illustrations of chemical formulae and the English equivalents of them. A very popular topic was uh, uh, diagrams explaining how the bicycle pump worked. And uh, there were also ones on how oil wells worked and carbon cycles and so on. Um, so uh, one of the things that we taught the students were, were comparisons. Um, as you can see, we have here a simple verbal thing, and we can see that uh, uh, Bottle C contains three times as much liquid as bottle B, and bottle B contains one third as much liquid as as, as, as bottle C. So, uh, so that was all right. And then right at the end of the book, I got onto table of graphs. And Fauzi, if we can see the bottom half of that slide, yes, that's it. Perfect. Um, and so one of the last exercises was um, to compare uh, the monthly rainfall in Alexandria and in London. And, um, uh, and unfortunately, I failed at this point to 
reintroduce all the work we've done on comparative statements. So, um, so we could say that in January, the same amount of rainfall falls on average in the two cities. Uh, or we could say in, in June, uh, uh, half a meter of rainfall falls in London, but there is no rainfall usually in Alexandria and so on. Um, but there was no structure to that. They just had to pick out individual statements. There was no attempt to give a coherent story about the rather interesting figures that you see. There was no, no discourse analysis. And there wasn't enough link, as I said, between the comparisons and the discussion work. But what we did do, we did have a, a section which continues to this day on linking as clauses, things like as is shown in table 13, because uh, it's been, always been my experience that the students rightly learn that finite subordinate clauses have to have a subject. But in uh, this is the one case where they don't, you don't say, as it is shown in table 13, but as is shown in table 13. And this is a, a very difficult and tricky grammar point, which goes against most of what yeah. they've learned and taught. Ah, so, yes, I yeah. Are we doing okay? All right, so let's, let's turn on. It's okay, it's okay Professor. You yes. You tell me. We'll go to sheet two. Yep. So the, the, theory, the theory behind this, for what was called information transfer, was provided by Professor Henry Widdison. And I'm just going to read you the first two sentences. The rest you can look at. Transferring information from a verbal to a nonverbal mode is an exercise in comprehension. Transferring from a nonverbal to verbal is an exercise in composition. This suggests that information transfer can serve as a transition between receptive and productive activities in handling written language. And he goes on to explain some detail about that one. Now that, uh, now that is very powerful methodologically. You can immediately see that we could adopt that as ESP practitioners, and we could adopt it that 50 years ago as being a very good kind of edu educational heuristic. The only problem was that's not what people do when they write about um, what's in tables and graphs. You may assume that your reader is a bit slow or inattentive, but you don't assume that he is blind. So what you have to do is pick out trends, generalizations, deviations and highlights that are not immediately apparent in just the numbers or the or the squiggles on a graph. Like uh, going back to the rainfall thing, like you could say that the generalization was that rainfall in London is pretty regular and occurs a similar amount each month, but in Alexandria, it is very irregular and there's no rain at all in the summer months. So we had to move on from that and if we could go down to the bottom of the page, yeah. So uh, I, I went to the University of Khartoum for five good years, but I didn't get back to discussing this kind of thing because I was teaching the law students, teaching the architecture students, and teaching the medical technology students. When I got to uh, a position at the University of Aston, I I shared um, for the first few months, I lived with uh, 
my my friend from Libya, Tony Dudley Evans, who was the uh, co-author of the nuclear series of textbooks, and he was working in Birmingham in the EAP unit, and I was working at Aston in Birmingham in the other unit. And while we were living together, we, we designed materials. I don't have examples of them anymore, but uh, I, I remember that one of the things that we were training our students to do was to dealing with unexpected, unexpected results, such as the discrepancy can be a tribute to blah, 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 or differences between the two sets of results can be ascribed to different economic circumstances. So bearing that in mind, let us now go to the University of Libya and the University of Michigan rather. And here we are. Yes, yeah, thank you. One of the things that we did, we had to do was reevaluate the English of international graduate students when they entered the university. We, we weren't very impressed with the accuracy of the TOEFL results, et cetera, et cetera. So we gave them a couple of tasks. And this is written task two, which is actually, I made a mistake. It was 15 minutes rather than 30 minutes for do, for do the start. We gave them a bit of data investigating aggression in eight-year-old children observed in a schoolyard um, for boys and girls and aggressive behaviors, pushing, kicking, cursing, chasing, and so on. We gave them all the first sentence and then told them to continue to write a few more sentences. In order to investigate the hypothesis that eight-year-old boys are more aggressive than girls, eight-year-old children were observed playing in schoolyards and incidents of certain aggressive behaviors were recorded. And if I was here, we could go to the bottom of the page. Thank you. Yes. And here we have uh, two, two, two efforts that the student produced. They're pseudonyms. As you can see in table one, we only considered four human aggressive behaviors. The most common were, were after several weeks, and that's very nice, after several weeks of observation in different school playgrounds, we found a percentage that appeared in table one, 60%. Pretty steady, straightforward, and, and, and really quite, quite competent. Probably, uh, we would say from that, didn't need to take a basic writing course, but would be encouraged to take a more advanced course. Another student, uh, a little bit more sophisticated. It was assumed that aggressive behavior consisted of the following. Nice assumption. As can be seen from the table above, nicely done. Chasing was the one behavior that was that was more pronounced for the girls, etc. So those were two. We only had one student, as I best I remember, who questioned the whole thing. Uh, this student wrote a, a short piece, remarkably cognitively impressive for 15 minutes, saying. Well, you know, if you look around a schoolyard, uh, chasing is a very obvious behavior. You don't have to be near, you don't have to hear, but if, you, but if you're also trying to count cursing, you have to be close enough to hear what the children are saying. And, and so, so he said, the whole thing is methodologically a, a, a mistake. Very impressive, got the highest brain. Now, if we could go on to the next one, sheet, sheet four. We're now going to uh, this, this textbook. Oh, they were not there. Right. Um, uh, 
now we're, we're attempting to actually teach this now for the first time. Um, so we're saying, in, first of all, you have to have a location statement as shown in table three or C figure two. Then you should attempt some generalizations. Uh, rainfall in London falls every month. Alexandria, there's only rain in eight months of the year. Then some highlights. Uh, in Alexandria, not a drop of rain for three months. And then exceptions, anomalies, surprises, problems. Um, this data may not, may, may not be reliable. Um, was the data for Alexandria collect, uh, collected on the coast or was it collected inland or at the airport or, or, and so on. Uh, so we developed units on, on that for the stem fields. And then we had, I think this is the best task we developed. Can you push it up a little bit? Um, a thousand years? Yeah, thank you. This one. You are teaching assistant for an introductory biology course with a total enrollment of 150. Exams are usually given in the evening to lose, to avoid losing valuable time. Because some students had evening commitments, the makeup exam is always given. The professor has noticed a big discrepancy between the scores of the last regular exam and those of the makeup exam. Because you administered the makeup exam, you have been asked to offer an explanation. You have prepared the data in table 13. Now write a data commentary, either as a formal report or as a personal memo to your professor. And then if you like comparison between the regular and makeup exams. 8672, time difference, number of students, who was in charge, whether examples, possible test questions were put up on the board or not, and how hot it was. Now, if you think about that, this is quite an interesting activity because you are putting the students in a pretty realistic situation. You're saying, here you are, you're a teaching assistant, the lowly of the low. You have a big professor. The results when you gave the exam were much worse than the when the professor Hello? gave the exam. Yep. Um, and uh, so. Yes. Tell me. So, so you know, you're putting them in a position of stress. It's not just a simple writing, boring writing little exercise. They probably now have to write something which is going to allow them to keep their job the next semester. And so if you think about what you might say or talk to your neighbor about what you might say, as we have a look at some of the examples of what they did. Oops, what have I done? Yeah. Yep. So the first one is pretty straightforward. It's perfectly competent but it's not not very it, it's just doing some obvious things all right it was hotter uh, we didn't have time for the uh, for, for some sample questions um, it was the end of the week rather than the middle of the week uh, the students were thinking about their weekends and so on then we have two more 
that come from our database. Can we have the next sheet, uh, Fauzia? Yeah, five. Here we are. Dear Professor, I spent a fair amount of time analyzing the test conditions of the average scores and could come up with four plausible causes for the discrepancy. The first is the time. Second, the temperature. Third, the failure to prevent examples on board. And then finally, the student takes a big risk and says, while 125 students took the regular exam, which you proctored, only 20, 25 students took the makeup exam, which I proctored. Due to the high student and proctor ratio, dishonorable behavior might not easily have been detected during the regular exam, resulting in high average scores. Wow. All right. So here's the Here's the student saying, well, you were half asleep, you know, when you were looking after it, and there was 125 students, and, and they were cheating. And then next, let's have a look at another, another example. Let's see. Yeah. Dear Professor, I read your message. I collected some data. And then the student goes on to argue, and it turns out he was uh, doing a PhD in statistics, that the results uh, were perfectly understandable, given the fact that the makeup exam sample size was only one fifth of the main sample size. So here we have an example, I think, of of, of a, a task, an activity of when students are uh, 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 given some numerical data and put in a position where they are uh, compelled to try and come up with a convincing explanation of the discrepancy. Going back to what Tony Dudley Evans and I did in the, those early days in Birmingham, talking about discrepancies. Okay, let us proceed, Fauzia, to the next sheet. Okay, this one we won't, is one whole page, so we'll have some difficulty getting it on, but we'll get, get a bit more of it on. So now we're on, a, on another textbook, English, in today's research world, um, and we give some information from the published in 2000, the, from the 1990, um, 1994 Science Citation Index. The share of mainstream journals, which countries are producing the most papers? And this is the kind of topic that uh, I think that English teachers, uh, even if they have literary backgrounds, um, can handle quite easily. We, we know something about geography, we know something about world populations, we know something about publications, we know quite a lot about whether academic publications are taking place in English or Russian or Arabic um, and so on. So this kind of figures, and these kinds of figures are quite interesting too, particularly for, for, for graduate students. So I, recomm I recommend them. Um, so, yeah, so it goes down from USA with 30%, Japan with 8%, China with 1.4% and so on. 
So just think for a moment, talk to your neighbor if you like, um, what you would say about that. So what would you say about that if you see and remember, this was published in 1995. Okay, let's go to the next sheet. With that in mind, so let's look at text A. And these are not student texts. These are texts uh, that, um, in fact, well, I wrote the first two, um, a friend of mine wrote the third one. So, 28, oh, always good to notice what is not there when you're trying to talk about tables and graphs, talk about missing inputs. So we don't have anything about Mexico or Egypt or Turkey or Nigeria or Venezuela. Then we get to the generalizations. Overall, the dominating position of the US is striking. None of the next group, Japan, UK, Germany, and France, reaches double figures. The world's two most populous countries, India and China, in fact, actually, it's China and India, I think, rank 13th and 15th, respectively. And then there's a kind of conclusion. It seems clear from the table that the scientific productivity is probably even more unevenly distributed around the world than average per capita income. Okay, that is, in these days, there is a lot of talk about misinformation and disinformation and fact and fiction. Text A treats the, the data as being reliable, useful, sensible, accurate. Now look at text B. The figures in the table are based on the small percentage of the world's scientific journals that is indexed by the Science Citation Index. This commercial database is strongly biased towards English language journals and those which are located in the most advanced countries in the Northern Hemisphere, because the selection criteria, etc., etc. The percentages illustrated in the table, therefore, do not reflect the quality and quantity of the scientific research being carried out internationally. Telling evidence of this can be seen in the low rankings and low percentages given for India and China. Okay, so here we have now a very different approach to the numerical data. We have essentially a, a harsh criticism of it as not reflecting the realities of the academic world. Because uh, they don't include journals in written in Arabic, for example. And then text C. I had a colleague, um, an English colleague in Birmingham, who went to then worked in in Finland for many years. So I asked him to write something from that perspective. Uh, this is what he wrote. At first sight, that would seem to indicate the US has an overwhelmingly dominating position. However, a different perspective emerges when we consider research article production in relation to national publication. As a Finnish researcher working in a country with a total population of only about 5 million, I can note that the percentage for Finland is only about 0 0.8. However, the population of the US is about 50 times larger than that of Finland, and a simple calculation shows that in terms of journal production per capita, 
Finland is actually more productive than the US. So here we have some numerical data, simple, apparently simple data. And uh, we've got three very different uh, write-ups of that data. Text A, take it as given. Text B, uh, question the, the whole basis of it. And text C, don't forget about the small country. We also play our role. And actually, per capita, we produce more stuff than you do in the United States. And then, then we can ask uh, the students to see if they can't amalgamate some stuff from text A, text B, and text C, and maybe some stuff from their own country and produce um, a, a longer uh, critical analysis of that data. And I think finally, we finish with, I'm going to bring you up to date with that. So now looking at what is the rankings of publication output per country, this is the latest data from the last five years. We can see that there's been a remarkable change. That China has shot up from number 15 to number two. India has shot up from number 13 to number seven. And America, America's predominance is now rapidly sh shrinking. It's only 50% larger than China, and it's only three times larger than the next countries. Now, of course, you could get your students to think about, well, it says citable documents. What are they? Well, we know they're journal articles, but are they patents? Are they government reports? Are they academic books? Are they textbooks? So <coughs> well, we can also think about, maybe we can use this data now and, and compare it with the earlier <coughs> data and ask the students to um, produce yet another uh, another account of what is contained in numerical data. So in this talk, I have taken you over 50 years working approximately on this kind of stuff, starting with fairly simple inform information um, transfer, moving on to data commentaries, moving on to critical assessments of the quality of the data that is being provided by the numerical account. Uh, I'm sure that Fauzia, if anybody wants to use some of these materials, I'm sure that Fauzia can, can make them available or you can, you can okay. down, download them for use. But that's what I want to say. And, and just to follow up on the previous speaker, uh, uh, I, uh, have remained all my life uh, to use the term that she has used uh, an ESP practitioner and not some. At any rate, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Swales. Now we move to the third keynote speaker, Dr. Pipit Rahaya. Rah Rahayu, sorry. Thank you for joining us. She is going to present a paper entitled Public Speaking Assessment Model with Sandwich Feedback Method through Web Based Technology for ESP. Well, Dr. Pipit uh, Rahayu is a doctor of language pedagogy from Faculty Languages and Arts in Pandag State University, West Sumatra, Indonesia. She is a lecturer of English department in University uh, Universitat Pasir, uh, Bengarian, Indonesia, since 2009. 
she has been she has been uh, teaching for more than 13 years for several subjects such as academic speaking public speaking research methodology introduction to literature and english for specific purposes her research interests focuses on public speaking skill and public speaking assessment she had experience in teaching uh, english for specific purposes like english for tourism english for hotel and english for midwifery she's also as a tourism ambassador and concerned to explore and promote malay culture tourism and heritage from uh, rio uh, province she had also experienced radio broadcaster, presenter, and some other skills as public speaker. She is currently the Dean of Faculty of Teacher Training and Education in University Tata Pazir, uh, Bangarian, Rio Province, Indonesia. Welcome to Issues in ESP uh, webinar. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, model sir. Good evening. Hello. Can you hear? Hello? Yes. Yes, we oh. hear you. Carry on. To meet you again here, Fawzia. <laughs> um, uh, well, what is this? So let me try to share the screen first. Uh, good evening to all of you. Good evening to Professor John Swells and Dr. Uh, Rauzia. The first speakers, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, let's see. So, what time is it now there? How's it? <laughs> you still unmute or your microphone? So let's... Yeah. It's quarter to 9 p.m. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, can you see my screen? No. Okay, thank you. Wait. Yeah. Um, good evening. Now, I would like to share a little bit about um, like what our moderator uh, said to us uh, just now is about a uh, public speaking assessment model. Um, the title will be uh, Developing Public Speaking Assessment Model with Sandwich Feedback Method through web based Technology for ESP. So um, let me try to share a little bit about this information. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you are talking about uh, public speaking, especially for uh, higher education, uh, it will be remains as one of the most desirable and necessary skills for university students, for college students to possess. And due to the importance of public speaking skills, assessing students' learning outcomes is also essential in higher education and helps um, to ensure students successfully achieve course competencies. But according to Browns and uh, Abhi Vikrama, there are actually two types of uh, assessments. The first one is a uh, summative and the second one is a uh, formative. If you are going to talk about summative assessments, Summative assessments is uh, employed to verify how well students have reached the objective at the end of the course or unit of instructions. However, in this uh, summative assessment, it doesn't provide any suggestions for improvement. While informative one, lectures not only assess students' uh, final results, but also focus on student learning process by delivering appropriate feedback. So feedback here is understood as the information from the lecturer to students on the correctness of their work and how to further improve their work. So let me uh, share a little bit about some cases happens in Indonesia in some private uh, universities. Lectures 
uh, usually use common sense in assessing public speaking. For example, when they did assessment, they just only focus to assess students' uh, pronunciation, for example, fluency, their grammar, vocabulary, and expressions. They do not focus to assess the contents or the purpose of the student's public speaking skills itself. Another case is commonly the content and the purpose of the speech, like for example, persuasive or informative speech is not assessed yet. Next, um, other problems comes when there was no enough time in giving feedback to students' public speaking performance. Usually in Indonesia, um, one class consists of um, 30 to 50 students and usually there will be take a longer time for lecturers to give a feedback. After that, there is no specific uh, model of different speech in public speaking. And the assessment of students' public speaking skill has been um, done manually. Some cases happen like what I've already said this in some private university. They still do assessment uh, by writing down a piece of papers and assessing their students in front of the class. Next, uh, this existing uh, public speaking assessment model doesn't help much to assess uh, the student's achievement in public speaking efficiently and effectively. It enforces lectures to consume much time to converse and accumulate the scores assessing the skills. Well, in this case, um, we would like to formulate the research questions or research problem. What is an appropriate model of public speaking assessment with sandwich feedback methods through web-based technology for ESP in University of Pasir Pengarayan. So actually, uh, in our screen, I have already provided some questions, but in this case, I would like to focus on two things. Is uh, how is the practicality of the public speaking assessment model with sandwich feedback method through web-based technology for ESP? And how is the effectiveness of this uh, public speaking assessment model? Well, um, this one, we go to definition of the key terms. Sandwich feedback methods, in this case, is a method which is consists of complement, criticisms, and complement in delivering the feedback for a public speaking assessment. And what best technology in this case is a free application created or designed as a platform to apply a public speaking assessment model. If you're going to talk about assessment like what I have already mentioned to you before, according to Brown and Abe Wikrama, uh, it will be deals with two things, summative assessment and uh, formative assessment. Then um, types of speech here, there are informative speech, while uh, students provide new information, new insights, or new ways of thinking about a topic. And persuasive, uh, persuasive speech, the goal of persuasive speech is, is to influence the attitude, beliefs, values of uh, others. And the last types of speech is commemorative speech, such as uh, presenting a speaker, giving and receive prizes, and so on. So here are the sandwich feedback method like what I have mentioned to you before. Actually, it is called the sandwich feedback because it weighs criticism between um, two layers, between opening and ending, like a petty wedge between two bonds, I mean here. So here, it is a feedback method that can give a simultaneously self-motivation to students for their public speaking. Uh, performance for their public speaking skill. Um, in this uh, article, I did some uh, development of the uh, public speaking assessment rubric, collaborated with uh, sandwich feedback method, and and we did it with the uh, board and girls tab themes starting from the need analysis, 
So we did need analysis to the students, to the SP, and then we go to uh, developing the preliminary form of the project, and then man field testing, then uh, man product revisions, preliminary field testing, operational field testing, final product revisions until dissemination. In need analysis here, uh, we are conducted with what our students need, like just need and what our curriculum demands. And there are two instruments used in this case. The first one is the instrument for um, need analysis, and the second one is instrument for product development. So here where the uh, need analysis process was conducted when the, I distributed some uh, questionnaires to the ESP students in the classrooms. And uh, in this case, three variables were measures in students' need analysis based on the Hutchinson's and Waters. There were students' necessities. We are going to see uh, what are the students' necessities for uh, public speaking assessment, and then likes or weaknesses, and then what is their uh, wants in public speaking assessment. So here are the variables of indicators of students' questionnaires. Uh, there are three things like what I have mentioned to you before. This is the students' uh, need analysis result. So here, students need a public speaking assessment model to help them to improve their performance and reflect the quality of student skills. The second one, students need a feedback method from the lecturer during public speaking assessment to know the strength. The third one, students need a specific public speaking assessment for different types of speech, especially for persuasive and informative. And students need an application technology as the media or as the platform for public speaking assessment. So it will be documented as, uh, documented as well. And some indicators also uh, conducted to see what uh, lectures needs in this case. This is uh, some indicators like what you can see from our screen now. And um, this is uh, the interview process at the time. There are two English lecturers as interview in this case. They teach public speaking subject in uh, English department and ESP students also. Uh, here are the result. The result also taken from their needs, weaknesses, and expectations. Lecturers consider that the existing public speaking assessment model did not cover the goal of public speaking subject. The indicator cannot measure the student performance in each type of speech. Besides, the large number of students also influence their processing in assessment, the feedback given to the students, only three to five in the classroom. So furthermore, there is no supporting media in doing the assessment of students' public speaking assessment. Then um, lecturers' expectation, uh, they want there is a, a specific they need a specific assessment rubric or indicators to measure different type of public speaking like persuasive and informative speech so that it will, it will help them to differentiate student comprehension in each kinds of speech. Another side, they want, uh, there is, uh, they, they need a specific application or platform or software as a media to help them in assessing process. So furthermore, uh, if it is possible, they want their feedback also provided in that application. So this is what the result of the lectures and analysis conducted at the time. We go to the developing uh, forms of the public speaking assessment model. Primarily form of the product was designed from the development of uh, PCSR, Public Speaking Competence Rubric by Lisa Scraber in 2012. And the principle of formative assessment and the result of need analysis. So uh, the model of the public speaking assessment here was uh, designed from the public speaking competence rubric by the Lisa Scraber 
integrated with a formative assessment here, where the formative assessment itself did a specific feedback. So in this case, I use sandwich feedback method because the process when the lecturers give uh, compliment, criticism and compliment will be give uh, some influencing for the students to improve their skills in uh, public speaking performance. And all of these uh, were designed in a specific uh, platform or specific software. So this is the a little bit review of the PSCR assessment model. Um, this is what we call the persuasive speech itself. Uh, I do believe all of us uh, has already has been knows this speech much, persuasive and informative speech. So here the sandwich feedback method. So um, in the process of assessing students' uh, public speaking performance in the classrooms, students uh, at the beginning, they perform their speech so they can choose while they are going to while they were going to choose a persuasive speech or informative speech at a time. And after that, uh, the lecturers will use uh, the application of the PIPA model, persuasive informative uh, presentation assessment. This is the product of these uh, articles. And then uh, they did and they giving, they give uh, feedback through these applications and the process uh, of the giving feedback itself should be started from the compliment, criticism, and compliment. So this is the rubric of PIPA assessment model. While uh, in this uh, rubric, the focus is uh, come from some indicators like organizations, and then uh, supporting material also takes an important role in assessing student performance. Then uh, content itself, while it should be persuasive or informative speech, then the articulations, nonverbal and visual aid. So this is the rubric of the uh, public speaking assessment model. Well, the, um, this rubric was created for public speaking skills, especially um, in assessing persuasive and informative speech. The rubric of uh, PIPA model consists of organizations, supporting material, the contents, especially for persuasive and informative, articulations, nonverbal communication, and visual aid. The organization here includes student arrangement in delivering the topic and presenting the information to audience, while supporting material here involves all points which is supported the speech with a variety of credible materials such as source and then facts or code, etc. While content in this case consists of persuasive and informative point and articulations includes the languages used by the speakers and nonverbal communication, it will be deals with the postures, gestures, and facial expressions. While facial aids means all aids that is used by speakers in the presentation. So this is the first of the sandwich feedback of the PIPA model. Uh, it showed that the development of PIPA model was designed with sandwich feedback method, which is proposed at the beginning by Don, uh, Don and Wayne, 2002. The concept in delivering the feedback is giving compliment, criticism, and compliment. So each stage has their own functions in influencing student performance in public speaking. The first compliment means is motivations. So here, the lecturers will give a feedback in order to motivate student performance. The second process or the second protocol is criticism. In criticism, the feedback from the lectures involves student weaknesses in public speaking performance. The lectures in this case will express or will state what is the weaknesses of students' performance for example, in their gestures or in the contents or sums in articulations and so on. The last stages is compliment. So here, the lectures will share the strength of the student's public speaking performance and some point that should be improved by students in the next performance. <coughs> 
the PIPA model developed by providing the rubric of public speaking assessments and sandwich feedback. The indicator of each assessment in the rubric consists of organization, supporting material, content for persuasive and informative, articulations, nonverbal communication, and visual aid. So furthermore, assessing process of public speaking skills conducted. The sandwich feedback method will be given by the lecturer. And the protocol in applied the sandwich feedback is started by giving compliment, criticism, and compliment. So uh, beside uh, we designed the platform or the software of this assessment model, the draft of the book also provided. PIPA model, especially for uh, students, students' book and lectures' book. So this is the a little bit showing to you from the application, the dashboard of uh, PIPA model applications. So lectures uh, and students also uh, may log into the dashboard. And uh, this is the indicators in the software. So later on, lectures may um, see all their scores or their point for their students' performance. OK, the effectiveness of the PIPA model itself, after revising and prototype based on the suggestions uh, common also from the experts and the validators, the field test was administrated to the uh, fourth semester students of the ESP. So here are the uh, results of the preliminary field testing of small group discussions. From the data collected, uh, we can see um, the result uh, state that the hypothesis test in this uh, article, uh, the T test is uh, more than 0 0.05, so it can be concluded that there is a significant effect or increase from the pre-test to the post-test conducted. And about the practicality of the this uh, PIPA model, practicality test for the students. So um, after taking the effectiveness test, the practicality test of the PIPA model uh, will be conducted at a time, and the questionnaires were distributed to uh, students, uh, 29 students. Then uh, this is the indicators of the uh, validity of the practicality test. The component of the practicality uh, were arranged based on web equal from Burns and Fijent. Uh, it comes from the usability indicators, information quality, and then service interaction quality. So here are the results. So here, public speaking assessment model with sandwich feedback method through web-based technology from students were 85.6%. The three measurements component were usability quality, information quality, and services interaction quality. And it shows that the, practic the practicality criteria was very practical. And it was interpreted that the students accepted the PIPA model was very practical. Sorry, Dr. Pipit. Yes. Would you please um, okay, try to uh, sum up the remaining points? OK. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. So um, we go to the conclusions. Yeah. So here, um, PIPA model can enhance uh, student public speaking skill during the assessment process. And it has a positive implication impact on the learning process of public speaking subject. So in this case, it will be helpful also for English lectures when they're going to assess uh, public speaking skill of student ESP. So it is uh, necessary, so will be help uh, students motivations in uh, public speaking performance. Okay, moderator, I think uh, it's quite enough for my presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pipit. Well, uh, thank you, dear professors and the doctors, for your 
insightful presentations. Well, now uh, uh, I think that uh, the debate is open. Or, Fuzia, what shall we do? Yes. We yeah. the questions or? Yeah, questions and answers, yeah. I guess yeah. some questions are written on in the chat. The chat yeah, yeah. I have noted. I have noted all the questions. Okay. Well, starting, starting by uh, Dr. Azarwell, she wants to ask Dr. Swales about his opinion about first EGAP and ESAP approaches. English for general academic purposes and specific purposes, I think. His opinion about. This is her first question. The second one, his definition for discourse community. And the third, why there is little discussion made Excuse me, about Salina, excuse me. Excuse me. Would you please read one by one and uh, let Professor or any other speaker to answer? Yeah. Okay. Well, the first question is his opinion about EGAP and ESAP. This is her first question. Yeah, English for general academic purposes and general, yeah. A specific academic purposes. Yeah. Unmute yourself, Professor. Professor, please enable your, enable your microphone. Like that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. So, there. This has been a uh, an argument that's gone on for years and years and years. But essentially, it's a discussion. It's a disagreement between uh, people who are more interested in theory and people who are more interested in practice. So, Professor Ken Highland, for example will argue all the time that we have to teach uh, um, English for specific academic purposes. We have to dive into the disciplinary needs of particular disciplines. But in fact, uh, there are two arguments, practical arguments against that. Often, um, especially in a country like America, it's very hard to get a class of non-native speakers who are all studying statistics or engineering. You have to uh, put a group of students from different disciplines together to teach them. And this has, in my view, great advantages. One, the students are not competing against each other as if they are, if you were teaching the third year economic students and so on. Uh, second, um, they learn a lot from each other. They learn, they learn that the requirements for a PhD differ from different parts of the university. And three, uh, they come out of the closet. They get out of their laboratory they get out of their little disciplinary area and experience a, a wider intellectual environment. So I myself, all more in favor of the English for, for general academic purposes and, and not the narrower ones. I'm not sure whether uh, the, the person who asked the question will agree with me, but that's that's my that's my position. The second question was about discourse community. Yeah, discourse. Your definition. My definition. Mm. Well, uh, I. A lot of people have used that. This is a an activity that many, many thousands of students um, in English composition classes today are asked to go and say, well, they worked at McDonald's and was working on McDonald's with a discourse community. And did you have to learn to say, did you want fries with that every time people asked for a Coca-Cola or whatever it was? Um, uh, 
and, or if they worked in, in a garage or wherever else they worked, and, and the specialized languages. Um, I still think uh, it's, a, it's a pretty fuzzy concept, but it's quite useful. Uh, I think that uh, the people attending today form uh, or potentially form a discourse community. We have shared interests in teaching people to speak or to write or teaching teachers to do a better job. Uh, some of the same names and some of the same terms come up again and again. Uh, we share interests as we've seen in assessment, um, uh, but we're not a speech community. We, when we leave Thank this you. community, we go home and we use different languages and different dialects and we talk about different things. Right? Thank you, Professor. So, well, there was a third a one. Bit. Third one, but perhaps ah, somebody yeah. else should have a question. Well, yes. <laughs> Let us give a chance to another uh, okay, uh, yes. attendee who asked a question. Uh, um, we have uh, Kawush Siham, I think. She asked the question, if writing is the most needed for ESP teachers, does digital writing minimizes this challenge? Uh, it's for all the, um, yes. the speakers. I, I'm, I'm too old to answer that. Let somebody younger answer this somebody more in the digital world than I am. Well, we have you... Wefa, I think she wants to, uh, I don't know, answer or... Would you please repeat the question, uh, Saliha? If writing is the most needed for ESP teacher, teachers, does digital mm -hmm. writing minimize this challenge? Well, uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, this uh, question, but uh, that we cannot limit uh, the needs uh, or we cannot uh, uh, make from writing as the mostly needed for an ESP teacher and exclude the three other skills. Yeah. But if we take uh, writing uh, during uh, or teach, teach writing during the digital era, yes, uh, we can say that yes, the digital writing can minimize for ESP teachers uh, many uh, challenges they could face uh, while developing this skill in their uh, in the ESP setting. Yeah, we can benefit from all what technology could offer us, uh, we uh, teachers, uh, and uh, mainly that uh, the main factor that could help us in doing uh, that uh, is learners' motivation towards uh, the uh, uh, digital uh, uh, skills and uh, we can say that they are more uh, well they can perform more than as we teachers as they are uh, mostly uh, uh, immersed in technology but you have to um, if I may say too but you, um, I, I absolutely agree when we talk about the ESP teacher as an ESP teacher but the ESP teacher in her training to get a master's degree or perhaps even a PhD, the writing is going to become very important for writing the thesis or writing the dissertation. Sure. After she has finished all that and returned to her teaching position, it may be a, a different matter, but in the academic world, in the scholarly world, it's writing yeah. that's more important than anything else. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <laughs> yeah. Doctor. Well, we have uh, another question, but I don't know. We have some uh, participants who raised their hands. They want to, uh, to participate. Hello. Doctor Saliha, can I say yeah, something? Wefa. Yeah. yeah, Wefa, you can. 
Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Saliha. Happy to see such eminent scholars. I'd like to thank the um, webinar chair, chair, sorry, Professor Rwa and Dr. Fuzi Rwa for bringing such eminent professors from which we have learned much. Well, I'd like to, um, to add something and ask a question. I would like to add something regarding the whether the writing skill or reading or whatever skill is important. As we know, as a general rule, it needs analysis always that determines which particular skill is needed by the learners most. But I totally agree with Professor Swales when he stated that the writing it's uh, absolutely true when we conducted needs analysis, especially for PhD students to carry out their PhD dissertations for yeah. computer science. If civil engineering, they usually ask for how to write their PhD thesis in English and writing was the most demanding skill in addition to the speaking one for presenting in conferences. Okay, they want yeah. to improve their speaking skills as well. Well, my question is directed to Dr. Radia Bugabus. Uh, I really appreciated also your presentation and we'd like to just comment or ask a question. Dr. Radia, don't you think that the ESP practitioners are still facing huge problems in their tasks and roles and they are very far away from adapting technology into their classes? Thank you. Thank you, Afa. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I agree with you that uh, holding many roles in their classrooms and uh, uh, caring more about developing a new skill, yes, it is too demanding. But uh, I think that uh, despite the fact that developing digital skills will take more from the time, from that time, but still the benefits they could gain, it will facilitate for them many tasks while fulfilling the roles in an ESP setting. As we can see, the to develop a material, making researches and manipulating the digital tools in the classrooms, I guess that those benefits uh, 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 since they will help him in fulfilling uh, his job uh, i think that it is really a necessity to uh, bother more about uh, this new skill yeah yet it is too demanding it's too demanding yeah. because too yeah demanding. It, because what we have observed that in the selection of material teachers, for example, when we, they'd like to teach a particular grammatical point, for instance, they need to select a particular text, text, okay, material in which he should find that particular point yeah. well exemplified. Exactly. So it's right. Okay, yeah. thank you so yeah. much. So uh, he is facing a problem in the selection of material when it comes to text. What about selecting materials in videos or using any digital area? I guess that the ESP practitioner, uh, it's too demanding. The, the job of the real effective ESP practitioner is too demanding and doesn't only rely on selecting just the use of or adapting ICT like in EGP classes. I guess so. It remains an opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Wefa. Thank you. Well, we have another question uh, asked by Bilqasim Uzum Dabat, addressed to uh, Professor Swayze. To what extent are your uh, 1985s enduring principles of ESP still valid and sufficient to describe the evolution of ESP? Uh, oh, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can give a history of all that. Uh, um, but I, I guess the question that arises is to whether the, as with the previous two speakers have been saying, whether uh, the traditional strengths of the ESP teacher, of the ESP practitioner, to be able to find a text that well exemplifies the grammatical or discourseful point he or she is trying to make. If, if all those things that, that we learned, 
Well, you know, transformational grammar and lots of sociolinguistics and all those kinds of things. Um, all that understanding of the language, maybe that is now becoming less important or perhaps more redundant as a result of Google Translator or as a result of chat boxes or as a result of uh, uh, multimedia phones that will translate what you want to say into another language. I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm too old uh, to, to know what's going on in the real model world, but I think it does, does raise questions. As the first speaker has put, uh, made very clear that um, our, our priorities for the training of ESP teachers in the digital world strike me as probably not being the same kinds of things that we want, that we have emphasized when, for example, I was running a master's degree in ESP in, uh, in a British university, when we were focusing on the varieties of language and things like that, and not really thinking and not able to think about how the technology would be changing the priorities that we needed to focus on. So I think you have a very good point, all of you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think that Yasmina Shorfi wants to say something. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Yamina. Yasmina. Uh, Professor, I'd like to ask you a question. When you were presenting your data, I mean uh, the uh, observation uh, texts, Okay, yeah. you were qualifying some text as being good and uh, compared with others. For example, he, uh, regardless of, uh, of uh, I mean, uh, the, the thesis, whether in chemistry, linguistics, literature, all of them are uh, part of uh, EAP, English for Academic Purposes. Yes. Now, when you've been presenting your data, you qualified some text as being good. Why, for example, uh, they, they contained uh, uh, first person singular, uh, they contained also a kind of uh, narrative language, okay? Why in EAP, uh, I mean, when we teach uh, academic writing, we keep focusing on uh, we keep focusing in uh, in the let or in our classes that the the writer must use the third person singular uh, must be very objective okay to convince readers okay it's not narrative or descriptive uh, uh, um, writing okay uh well, there is uh, much research in the last 20 or 30 years to suggest okay. that uh, academic and scientific communications are not the uh, detached, objective, um, from a distance descriptions of what happens, uh, uh, but are much more persuasive documents, although the persuasion is much more subtle than it is in political speeches or, or, or something, but it still exists there. Um, the work of somebody like Professor Hunston uh, uh, on evaluation shows that evaluative language is yeah. very much a, a part of uh, the way that we academics uh, go about uh, writing about the topics that interest us. Um, so, um, and there has been uh, uh, a remarkable increase in the use of first person pronouns in, um, in scholarly writing, particularly we, has been used very conveniently by groups of scientists who, uh, who often there are six or seven authors for a paper, so they just, just say, we did this and we did that. Um, the, 
this is a complicated topic and I don't want to go on too long, but uh, um, many years ago, Professor Taroni of Washington argued that uh, scientists use we when they introduce some in innovation or some new development or some invention. And they use the passive when they're describing standard procedures. And this is a very nice form function distinction that we use the active with we for our good innovative stuff. And we use the passive for the boring procedural stuff that we have to get from. But nobody has been able to prove it. It's a wonderful hypothesis, but nobody has been able to prove it. I haven't been able to prove it. Yes, Saliha, we move to the next question. So where, well, where another are we? question. Yeah. Another Is question comment? comments. Yeah, if possible, comment on this. Dr. Saliha, is it possible? Sure. I mean, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, go ahead, Wefa. Okay. Professor Swills, I, I really appreciate um uh, what you were talking about, and I personally teach to my learners what you have stated in 1974 uh, regarding the use of a pre-modifying participle, like a given element, a given reaction. Oh, which you well, 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 okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yes, all right. <laughs> Good for you. Yes. Yes, you had, yeah, I teach my learners when it comes to grammar in ESP. I say to that Swales in 1974 discusses the function of the pre-modifying participle given, such as a given element, a yep. given reaction. Yes. He points out that expressions of this kind are very common in scientific writing, and consequently they should be taught by ESP teachers. And this and here I mean the didactics of teaching ESP. And I would like to point out another uh, point when it comes to the points to be taught. Here I would say that it depends on the field that we are teaching. If we are teaching English for science and technology, the grammatical points that needs to be emphasized are pre-modifying participles, nominalization, the use of models to, exp to avoid mm -hmm. any kind of... Um, uh, let's say involvement, okay, or scientific objectivity, etc. If we teach English for journalism, we need to, for example, to focus on teaching reported speaks. So each field demands particular points to be focused on. I guess this is the point that I'd like to add to what you have already stated. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm very impressed. I'm yeah, very thank impressed. You. Thank you, Wefa. I've, for I've forgotten about given. I spent a long time trying to understand it in the Sudan. And uh, yes, thank you for that. Thank well, you, Professor. Another question asked by Zin uh, Amel. Can we teach academic Joras, mainly research Joras, without modeling? Say again, please. Can we teach academic Joras, mainly research Joras, without modeling? Without? Modeling. Modeling, okay. Yeah. yeah, without modeling. I think that's pretty hard. I think it's much easier to show students a text and how it is constructed than okay. just talk about it. Yeah, right. no, I, I think you need, if by modeling I understand analysis, then yes. I agree. Another question. Is explicit teaching of Joras helpful enough for novice students or should we design Joras? Uh, to identify the gap, I think. Actually. Uh, yes, I think so. I, I mean, uh, awareness, Jara awareness task. Yeah, I, I think you can start very simply. Uh, you have something that you want to sell, and you want to put a little notice up. Okay, you have a a transistor radio that you want to sell because you've now gone all digital or whatever. So, what do you do? 
what information do you put on this piece of paper that you're going to stick into the student common room or wherever you can place it, right, on a notice board? You're going to have to put what it is, what it costs, where you go to get it, and so on. And that's similar, you know, to how people organize menus in restaurants and other things. You don't have to deal with academic genres. As my friend and colleague Anne Jean says, you can often start with simple things. And there's some very interesting cross-cultural differences that can be exploited. I mean, in Algeria and in the United States, I suspect that wedding invitations are somewhat different. Would I be right? Would I be right? <laughs> get invited to a wedding, the piece of paper that you get that's different. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question asked by uh, Soriana Yassin. What would be the most appropriate materials for ESP classes in Algeria? I think this maybe <laughs> this question is addressed to uh, Radia, Dr. Radia. Well, Bukhari. I think it should be addressed somewhere else. Uh, uh, I uh, some, let somebody else answer that. Radia, Radia, excuse yes. me. Yes. So I give you a few seconds to to reflect on the question. I want to just yeah. transfer this message from Hannah, who is really, uh, I mean, he's fond of Professor. Uh -huh. He said, uh, send my regards to Professor Swells and uh -huh. tell him how much I love and respect him. He's my role model. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is Hannah, yes. Love you <laughs> so, love you so much. much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank well, you. I've always been a teacher, you see. I mean, oh. although I, people think of me as being somebody who writes theoretically about genre and so on, but yeah. I've never been out of the classroom. Um, and I miss it, not being in it today. So, uh, uh, as uh, the first speaker said, uh, I'm an ESP practitioner. Yes, Radia, over to you. You may answer the question. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, 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 Soriana has said uh, the appropriate ESP material. You have said that, uh, Sariha. Yes. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, uh, thinking about materials, uh, we almost, uh, we have to start from needs analysis and uh, it is uh, the learners' learning needs that determine the appropriate material for an ESP setting. Well, one material may be uh, suitable and fit to a given context, but it can't fit another context. I think that, uh, well, uh, well, effectivity, if... yes, Professor, you want to? Uh... Well, I was going to say, yes, the yes, analysis yes. gets you somewhere. But you have to design good tasks as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, sure. and that's a lot of skill and needs some imagination. Yes. And it's not as though it's a like an automotive production line that you start sure. at one end and your materials come out automatically at the other end. No. It's well, some uh, artistry uh, uh, and craft and skill is needed to take what your sure. perception of what the students need or want, and then to turn it into something, you know? Absolutely, uh, Professor. Well, uh, designing the design. Well, like having a restaurant, you know, you've got to, you, you, okay, needs analysis gives you all the different ingredients, but you still yeah. got to cook it, and you've got to turn it into a tasty and attractive meal. Sure. For your so, uh, if I'm not strong, uh, Professor, uh, once, once we determine learners' needs, yeah. it's time, high time to put it into practice. And what is this practice? We're starting from uh, the appropriate choice of the material, then uh, trying to uh, design the appropriate uh, tasks that fit this material and could help us uh, move uh, the learner towards a given objectives 
uh, and fulfilling and developing uh, certain uh, abilities or new abilities that were uh, once uh, discovered uh, via needs analysis uh, investigation. If I'm not wrong, uh, Professor. Yeah, I think I think uh, I, I think it's important uh, is, is trial and error and revising your materials. Yeah. Yes. Just don't think because you've prepared them that your time is finished after you've tried them out. Then you need sure. to think, or sit down and think, what worked, what didn't work, what yes. can I rearrange? And that's that's part of the skill. Yeah. And non-stop uh, process, non-stop yeah. process, well, it yeah. is recursive. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you, yeah. Professor. Recursive process. Yeah, exactly. Doctor, yes. can I say something, please? In a, yes. In addition to this? I mean, I don't know. What? I mean, I'm not into Sorry. Sorry for us here. <laughs> no, I'm I'm commenting on what what you have said, dear doc, professor and doctor, uh, regarding the flexibility. What's good in ESP is that it's flex flexible, and there is what we call an ongoing assessment. We should never take any course for granted, mm -hmm. and we can each time readjust. Means that it is the the conducting these analysis at the beginning. It just does the first step, but we shouldn't take it for granted. We should we should keep on assessing uh, our lectures, okay, readjusting them um, uh, during each course or lecture. Uh, yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, Emel, Emel, wanna wanna talk? She was yeah. waiting. I think yeah. that Emel is insisting to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, let me say, let yeah. me say one thing about that. Um, um, very unfortunately, in my opinion, my university now, the University of Michigan, insists that instructors deliver their full syllabus before they start teaching their classes. And I've always been on the, on the belief that I will prepare the first three or four or five weeks and say, that's my syllabus. But then I say, but the whole syllabus is negotiated with the students. As you get to know the students better and their strengths and weaknesses, you begin to put more emphasis on one thing and decide to leave something out. Uh, and this idea that you have to produce your syllabus you know, before you've even met the students for the first time, strikes me as being a administrative bureaucratic nonsense. Uh, so that's what I mean by flexibility. Yeah, yeah thank you. Emel? Emel, the floor is yours. If you want to say something, unmute yourself, Emel. Well, uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Yes. Okay. So pleased to uh, listen to uh, Professor Wales. Well, then not anymore. Yeah, okay. right. I'm, I'm actually I'm teaching genre analysis to my EFL students, uh -huh. master degree. Uh, and uh, actually, we had uh, we had been through uh, debatable issues concerning your concepts over genre, genre analysis, the definition of genre, and the criteria uh, that is set to classify genres and so on and so forth. Mainly, the one of communicative purpose, the discourse community, and the uh, let's say the characteristics how to claim or how to assign. A discourse community as such as being a discourse community and we once discussed the uh, that issue of uh, uh, the ownership or the establishment of the coffee owners you still remember oh, one okay of, yeah. okay yeah and whether oh whether, whether it is a discourse community or not still as to now we couldn't uh, agree whether it is a discourse community or not but our students or my students answer or agree that it is a discourse community or it is not a discourse community because uh, they lack a kind of for you. Yep. Yeah. Are they well, right? If we can say that. Uh, something else, uh, while uh, teaching academic writing to, to my students, I designed a kind of 
uh, let's say, genre awareness tasks. Uh -huh. Sometimes I just compare between uh, some samples of academic genres, let's say the introduction of a dissertation with an introduction of a research article okay. or an abstract with an introduction mm -hmm. or just to set my students order the, uh, the different moves of the abstract or the introduction. At least the, I, I try to make them acquainted and familiar enough with the, uh, the, uh, the academic genre. Because uh, here in Algeria, uh, writing a thesis is, 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 is considered, uh, let's say, uh, a kind of, it is a graduation uh, uh, genre, and they need to write this genre being a target genre, in fact. Okay. That's why I asked about modeling. About modeling. Oh, you're the modeling. Okay. Modeling. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I find I couldn't teach academic writing without uh, modeling. Okay. Uh, well, um, yes. Uh, uh, there's a danger, of course, uh, if um, the modeling is too strict. You you have to try and admit that um, <coughs> there's flexibility. But, um, it's not. Uh, it's not like in the army, you know. You do this one. This is what you do first. This is what you do second. This yeah. is what you do third. This is what you do fourth. Now That's you can cool. fire the gun. Um, it, it, it's not not as strict as that. Um, and um, some people accuse genre analysis of being uh, of being prescriptive, of laying down rules. But in fact, what genre analysis does is, is not lay down rules, it's provide people with opportunities. New opportunities. I do agree. This is a way, if you didn't know this, this is a way you can do this, if you didn't know this before. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, another question asked by uh, Hannah to Professor Swales. Um, is about the demands and expectations of discourse communities and how they differ from one context to another. Uh, demands and expectations of discourse communities. Yes, I think one of the interesting things about discourse communities is what you don't need to say. That is uh, what you can be silent about, which is taken for granted. That which is um, so you can exchange numbers and you don't have to explain what those numbers are if you are dealing with a particular product. Um, um, I think this is. Uh, I think this interest, this this question of um, discoursal silence, uh, is something that we've not paid perhaps uh, enough attention to in ESP. Uh, what uh, what we don't need the students to say or write. Um, we focused more on what they need to do. Um, and it might be interesting to think about that as part of the expectations of a discourse community. Um, with, um, there's a nice example from Henry Widdison. It's a, a man and a, a husband and wife. Um, and the phone rings, and the wife says, I'm in the bath, and the husband says, okay. That's all that's said. It's not. Uh, I can't answer the telephone, dear, because I'm in the bath. And the, and the husband saying, I understand you're in the bath, dear, and you can't get to the telephone, so I'll get to the telephone for you, okay?
So close knit communities don't need to say things. Husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, twins. Twins are famous for being able to communicate with hardly any words. Am I making sense? Time to go home, is it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John, as well as for your answers. We are Thank so you. pleased to have you here in the second edition of the webinar, international webinar and issues uh, in ICP class. Fuzia? Fuzia, yeah. Us? Yes, yes please. who's calling me? Who's calling me? Uh, we carry on with the questions or? Sorry? We carry on with the questions or we- uh... Are there other questions? Yeah, normally there is one. Okay, one more. Finish with the last one. Yes. Yeah. Asked yes, by, by Dr. Azarwell. Any suggestions uh, uh, addressed to uh, Dr. Uh, Swales? Any suggestions about designing academic writing courses where most of learners have poor level? Have two levels? Poor, poor levels. Poor levels. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, um, I, I experienced that in the, in the Sudan. Um, what we tended to do was to have a silent class um, where the series of activities going from the ones for the level one and those for level four um, and then we used to make most of the class silent and a student, when they completed one of the tasks, would come up to me or my teaching assistant with their paper. So they weren't in lockstep so that it was, um, it was too easy and boring for the, the top level and it was too difficult and uh, incomprehensible for the bottom level. But if you kept it silent and they had reading and writing tasks and, uh, and so on, that was a way of trying to cope with the, the very mixed ability of the group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. So shall I, shall I draw this session to a close? Everyone is tired, I presume. Oh, um, gosh. Yeah. I, I would think so. I think so, yes. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so listening listening to an old man is no fun, is it, at any rate? But... Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So I want to I wanna thank all the participants, all oh, the you. speakers, the attendees, uh, Dr. Uh, Rabia Bogibs, Professor John Swayze, oh, Dr. Thank you very much for I've enjoyed it, yep. Of course, yeah. of course. And uh, thank you, the attendees, for your positive feedback in the chat box. Everyone uh, liked the session, everyone enjoyed, everyone learned, and everyone is, um, is thanking you, Professor. Everyone is thanking the speakers. So before we draw this to a close, just I give uh, the floor and uh, to uh, Professor Halalet to give a few words in order to conclude this, uh, this okay. session. Yes. yes. So Hila, so over to you. Uh, thank you, Fuzia. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor, uh, Doctor, or the organizers of the webinar, uh, Doctor Fuzia Rwak, uh, Nasrin, uh, Professor Nasrin Huwar, for uh, the organization of this interesting webinar, and uh, I, uh, I thank you also for uh, having me here. Uh, I really appreciate uh, 
uh, the, this discussion and uh, uh, to uh, first I would like to thank Dr. Radia Bougabs from Algeria who presented a case study of uh, Constantine uh, about teaching ESP in Algeria context, uh, sorry, Algerian context, a case of Constantine uh, University students. It was a thought, a thought provoking results were provided by uh, the researcher concerning the uh, integration of uh, digital tools or ICT in the ESP setting. Of course, to improve the digital literacy skills. Uh, and I would like also to thank Professor uh, John Swales from uh, United States or USA. Uh, his uh, presentation was entitled From North Africa to the American uh, Midwest, the long story of EAP writing material based on nonverbal data, where uh, uh, Professor Wills uh, provided us with uh, different studies related to his experiences of teaching in uh, the different in different places. Sorry, in Libya, in the uh, Sudan, UK, and the USA. Of course, his presentation was very interesting and fruitful for EFL teachers in general and ESP teachers and researchers in specific. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Pipit Brahayu, yes, from Indonesia, who whose presentation also was entitled Developing Public Speaking Skills Assessment in, univers in University Students. Here, the researchers uh, uh, emphasized the content and purpose of uh, speech rather, uh, rather than assessing uh, language, other language aspects like grammar, uh, vocabularies, uh, pronunciation, etc. A case study here uh, 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 was uh, of Indonesian students where the researcher opted for a sandwich feedback method and using a PIPA uh, model. The results were also very interesting. And uh, in general, the discussion here, I think, uh, frankly, was the most uh, fruitful uh, and uh, thought-provoking part. I personally appreciated it uh, and I, I learned a lot from it. Finally, I would like to thank Dr. Fuzia Rweg, Professor Nisrin Rouar uh, for the organization. I would like also to thank uh, Saliha, Dr. Saliha for her moderation. I would like to thank the attendees and uh, uh, I hope to meet in the future, inshallah, in another uh, webinar. Thank you, Fuzia, and congratulations for uh, this achievement. See you, Thank you. in the future. Thank you, you Professor. Yep. Thank you, Fuzia, for everything. Yep. Thank you, Professor, for making my, my dream come true, and uh, everyone learns from you, and uh, oh, as well. I expected. Happy for you, Fuzia. Happy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So, um, this event wouldn't have uh, taken place uh, without your help, without your assistance, without uh, you for having accepted my invitation, all of you. I love you all, even the attendees for uh, staying at, for, at this late uh, hour. Mr. Uh, Aish, thank you so much. He didn't sleep for one week and I'm so sorry. And I hope that uh, the event was fruitful and compelling to oh, all yes. of the attendees. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Sandy, You're love. Good. You're good. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. you. Welcome, welcome, my pleasure. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you. I know you were, you were very hectic the, the, uh, the previous week. I hope that the last event, inshallah, uh, it's going to be on 25 February, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Aish? 
Yes, yes. Inshallah. Uh, so it's, yeah, yeah. And many, many other scholars time. will be gathering. Inshallah, it's yeah. going to be the last event. And we will have further information in next Inshallah. Week. Yes, for the last series. Just a, just a word for Professor Professor Spells. Are we right? He left. <laughs> I think he left. It's okay. It's okay. No problem. So, love you all and enjoy your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank well, you. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Happy Thank to see you. For Thank your you. Thank you. Thanks for your love. Bye bye. 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 bye.